this month's webinar um, from Yorkshire Care Equipment based on rehabilitation using moving and handling techniques and equipment. Very pleased, very proud and very excited um, for this webinar. Um, what I'm going to do is bring on our guest speaker in just a few minutes time. Um, but for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, just a little bit of information on us. Just bear with me two seconds. So I am the Business Development Manager for the north of the country. Um, I've been with Yorkshire Care Equipment for a while now. Um, my role is predominantly based in the acute settings, um, hospitals, care homes and hospices around the north of the country going down to about the Midlands. A little bit about Yorkshire Care Equipment if you haven't dealt with us before. Um, if you are new to these webinars, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Yorkshire Care Equipment, we're entering our 50th year. Um, big birthday celebrations planned uh, in the next few months. Some really exciting uh, things to bring to you over the next few months as well um, by way of new product releases and some innovations as well. Um, what are we all about? We're about enhancing quality of life um, using the products um, that we bring to bear, the innovations that we bring to the market, anything that we can do to enhance the quality of a patient's life. We will, with your help, of course. We work with 19,000 healthcare professionals um, all across the UK and beyond, in fact. Um, very proud to have those tight-knit relationships built over many, many years. We listen up closely with you uh, and we're proud to have that alliance. Um, we work closely on assessments as well. We have a team of assessors uh, that covers the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, we work closely with OTs, clinical leads, physiotherapists um, to help create uh, the right kind of rehab and reablement solutions for your patients. Uh, and in terms of the kind of equipment uh, that we put together, we're very much seating specialists. Um, and that seating can go into private residences, care homes and hospices, as I say, uh, and obviously acute wards in hospitals up and down the countryside. In terms of some core equipment that we have, some things you'll be familiar with, I'm sure, by now. Uh, the Razor 2 falls lifting device, fabulous piece of, uh, piece of equipment um, that dramatically reduces the number of ambulance call outs it can get. Um, a frequent faller up um, in less than a minute with just one person assisting them. Uh, very quick, very easy, um, able to be utilized out in the community as well as within care homes and hospitals as well. Um, the Razor M, which is the manual version of the Razor 2, um, even more simple um, a piece of equipment, but just as successful. Um, then the hip guard, a fabulous product, a, uh, a wearable belt uh, designed for everyday use um, with some very trick technology built into it, um, which detects a fall uh, on either side and is designed um, to, uh, to allow an air cushion to deploy in a fraction of a second um, as the patient is actually falling. And as a result, um, we can uh, we can try and cut down the number of hip fractures and it's proven to do so. So a fabulous piece of kit that we're proud to sell. In terms of some of the core products, um, the Prospect family, the Prospect Rise and Recline chair, as you can see, designed to work in tandem with the SARA Steady, uh, ideally suited for hospitals and care homes, um, very much focused on infection control, especially in the uh, the climate that we all find ourselves in now. Um, a fabulous piece of kit. And um, the Prospect Hospital Chair, as the name suggests, um, equipped for the vast majority of wards across hospitals, um, ideal for porterage and shuttling from ward to ward with electric motors that allow for tilt in space, uh, seat depth adjustment electrically, and also uh, seat rise too. In terms of our, our own family of chairs, the Lento family of chairs, uh, the Lento care chair, um, fabulous care chair, fully adjustable, seat width, seat height, seat depth, um, as well as several other adjustabilities there, all without the need for tools or specialist training, um, allowing you to do your assessment and then make the chair fit that patient 
um, for uh, for the immediacy and then as their needs may change, the chair can change with it. Fabulous piece of kit. And if you'd like to see it, we'd be more than happy to show it to you. Uh, the little Lento, which as the name might suggest, the slightly smaller version, ideal for paediatric units. Um, and small adults too. And then the Lento Rise and Recline Chair, all the adjustability that you would find in our care chair in an electric rise or recline, um, ideal um, again for hospital settings, uh, as well as care homes and private residences too. And then lastly, uh, the newly released Lento Bariatric Rise and Recline Chair. Uh, ever since its launch at the tail end of last year, it's gone down extremely well. Uh, a 50 stone weight limit means it can pretty much take any bariatric patient that you might be working with right now. Uh, all the adjustability of all of the Lento range built into there. So it's a world first for us, um, the first fully adjustable electric rise and recline chair in the world. And coming very, very soon indeed, another world first, another new innovation uh, that we're extremely proud to be releasing into the general market in the next few weeks. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, it's going to be uh, a really exciting product and I think you're all going to like it very much. So a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Penny Townsend. We're delighted to have her. Thank you so much, Penny, for agreeing to do the webinar with us. And without further ado, if I pass it over to yourself. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is always weird when I can't see myself. I'm going to share my screen with you now uh, and do a bit of an introduction of myself. Um, so, hang on, you are screen sharing. Hang on, stop share. I am having a technical problem now, let me see. Right, share screen. Anyway, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Penny Townsend. I'm a paediatric specialist um, and <sighs> sorry, sorry guys, I'm having sorry. a little bit of a... No problem. Penny, I've stopped sharing my screen. You should be able to share yours now. Okay, let me go back. Okay, I don't want to be on that slide though. Let me try it again. Okay, I am. I am having a few technical difficulties. It worked beautifully well earlier. I can't seem to go back to my first slide. I'm working on it. For some reason, guys, I am um struggling to get back to my first slide. Paul, let's try a new share. Penny, sorry, um, sorry, this, this may help. Um, I can share my screen and you can simply tell me when to click across 
to the next slide and we can go through it that way around if let's you like. Do it, let's do it that way then because I can't yeah, I can't get it to move from the slide that I was on. So no, uh, no worries. Yeah, no worries if you at could all. do that, Steve, that would be brilliant. We can overcome. Excellent. Can everybody see that? We think now they can, can't we? Yeah. So, Steve, if you could click on to that next slide, then, please. So, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm a physiotherapist by background, the paediatric specialist. Um, I've worked for the last 16 years for the local authority as their moving and handling advisor. Um, and I work independently as well, still as a physio and a moving and handling specialist with a range of children and adults with complex care needs. I speak at national and international conferences on paediatric handling, because that's my passion. Um, I've had quite a few articles over the years published it for the National Back Exchange Journal column. Um, I've recently actually had an article published for the International Journal of Safe Patient Handling and Movement, looking at um, the risks around low level working for staff who work in the early years sector. Um, I peer reviewed the moving and handling book uh, the NB produced in 2011 and I actually have just co-authored the second edition which is now available from National Back Exchange which has got loads of top tips about moving and handling children actually and there's some relevance there to adults as well and I'm a very active member of National Back Exchange. So that is me, I don't um, profess to have all of the answers around moving and handling and rehab and today is going to be a little bit about sharing some top tips around rehab and using our moving and handling equipment so that we can work a bit smarter as therapists but also some case studies around using equipment to help people achieve um, some better outcomes for them in terms of their overall comfort and using equipment and actually how that can be used in a therapeutic way as well. So our learning outcomes are basically look at the difference between care handling and therapeutic handling because sometimes there's a little bit of a mismatch um, again which is relevant from a um, professional point of view how we delegate activities to others and our roles and responsibilities around that one of my biggest bugbears with my client group is um, getting people to engage with good moving and handling practice but and, and using it sort of talking about the complexities of the client so thinking about our safety things that we should think about to keep the process safe for the clients as much as the people who are doing the moving and handling as well and then some just practical little case studies that I've done over the years and then there will be a, a, a question and answer session so hopefully it's just going to give you a little bit of a flavour of everything so next slide brilliant you're ahead of me Steve fantastic so um one of this one of this the reason I've put this slide in is it's really important that whether we're thinking about care handling or therapeutic handling it's really important that we assess and reassess and always take action in a measured and proportioned and balanced manner so sometimes I come across situations in my role as an independent um, advisor where there's maybe a threat to take people down a safeguarding route because they're not quite doing what the professionals want them to do so it's trying not to alienate people and to make sure that actually any decision making is is balanced and looking at the best interests of the client and the, the people that might be doing the handling but the assess and the reassess bit is is really important and it's a, a colleague of mine who brought it to a uh, moving and handling meeting many years ago and she'd been out to assess a client with MS in the morning with a toilet and sling with the team of carers that were looking after this lady and the toilet and sling worked brilliantly well um, so it was left on site because all the staff were um, well well trained and knew how to use it the care team then went in in the evening and the lady actually slipped out of the sling and actually that was a learning process for all of us in the moving and handling world to say that when you see somebody at different times of the day their abilities may be really really different so actually sometimes when we're doing assessments it's not just that snapshot at the time we might need to go back and assess again at another time um, again it's remembering as well that people um our risk assessments can be used to actually highlight maybe an improvement in somebody's functional skills from a therapy point of view, or actually sometimes it can show sort of deterioration. So it actually helps us to mark our work almost. Um, and a story from my uh, background with a young lad that I worked with a few years ago, he had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which I'm sure you're aware is a degenerative 
uh, condition and I'd been asked to go into the school with the OT to have a look at him for toileting and we gave him a toileting sling and it worked and then I was called by the school about three or four weeks later to say could you come and review um, Hasnan because actually with the sling isn't working for him and so we ended up having to put him into a more supportive sling that still allowed him to use the toilet and he actually said to me you've made me very sad and, and you've upset me. And I said, why, why have I upset you? I, I don't understand. And he said, because you've just shown me how bad I'm getting and how quickly I'm getting so bad. So sometimes that was a lesson for me then to think about actually when I do these assessments is that actually I'm trying to have the least intervention, but sometimes maybe you need more intervention so that you're not actually highlighting somebody's deterioration to them in the same way. So that's just a bit of food for thought really. So Steve, could you go on to the next slide, please? So definition, um, what is therapeutic handling? I think as therapists, certainly as physios, we sort of sometimes forget that therapeutic handling is actually manual handling. And we tend to be um, physios and OTs, we tend to be sort of more risk takers. And sometimes at um, our own downfall really is that we, we perhaps put more stresses on our body than we'd expect uh, a carer to, to do. So we do take calculated risks. Um, and this was the idea about the rehabilitation handling and using the moving and handling equipment, because actually I'm getting older and I know that I can't do the same things that I used to do from a physio point of view with children uh, because I'm getting older. So I'm using the equipment more and more to help me so thinking outside the box a little bit to help me do my actually physio programs with with the youngsters I work with um, again we need a clear assessment as a as a as a, a therapist to make sure that we've got the appropriate tasks highlighted that we're working towards their optimal function um, and what we must do is we must have that risk assessment completed and documented and whether you use separate um, paperwork for that so risk assessment paperwork or whether you record that in the patient's notes it's up to you where you do it or how your organization does it I must admit in my patient notes I tend to record the risk assessment not on separate paperwork but within my note note keeping system so our considerations as therapists around man, uh, therapeutic handling uh, it's just to have our clinical reasoning set up um, and to consider what they can do for us as well. Um, sometimes I think we um, forget that they might they can do things for us. Um, you know, I'm thinking about sort of one of the youngsters that I work with, that they are very dependent for carers on all activities of daily living. Um, but actually this young lady can turn her head to help her role in, but actually people forget that she can do that. So it's making them part of the process. So thinking about their ability always putting them in the optimal start position and thinking about the risk to the service user and to us as a therapist and think of what alternatives might be out there in terms of a piece of equipment. And I know obviously not all of you will be involved in paediatrics that are listening to this today, um, but actually one of the case studies I've got is from a, a young man. And obviously my case studies are based on children generally. Uh, it was a young man where the physio was wanting him to be on a sideline board for his posture. So basically it's just a piece of equipment that you can put somebody on their side um, so that they can have a change of position. Um, we had a disagreement over it because she wanted him on the sideline board. The members of staff that were working with this young man in the class were struggling to get him into the position because he was a very big boy. Um, he weighed about um, 15 stones. So he filled up, ah, go back, he filled, he filled the sideline board. So they were struggling to roll him into his side and they were all quite short people and they'd all now got injuries. So actually we considered the alternative. So actually sideline was the thing that was right for him because that's what he actually needed um, to be in that good position. And it was good for his chest. Um, but actually what we decided to do in the end so that we weren't risking our staff is we used, we brought it out of the hygiene suite and we used one of the changing beds and we hoisted him onto the changing bed and we could then roll him onto his side and use blocks to keep him inside line. So actually, sometimes it might be that we can't use the piece of equipment for, because it impacts on the moving and handling for the carers. So it's always being mindful that there are other options out there. It isn't always around a piece of equipment. And he mixed that, that up a little bit with lying on his side on the changing bed 
supported with blocks and wedges and actually sometimes on the floor as well so he then had a different position and perspective of the world as well in the classroom so it's thinking about those alternatives that we can do as well okay you can go on to the next slide so um the difference between care and therapeutic handling um obviously from a therapy point of view it is initiated by the therapy staff with our outcomes and goals that we want for that client taking into account as well what the client actually wants um you know we have to consider their goals sometimes they might not be realistic goals and that's how we then manage them obviously from a care point of view all patient handlers will receive some moving and handling training at some point to allow them to do their job. As a therapist, it's calculated risk taking and in the care handling arena, it would be classed as minimal risk taking um, because they're not trying to get people sat up on the edge of the bed necessarily. I actually, if you've ever done any amount of um, care work looking after somebody, which I do on quite a regular basis, um, I would disagree it's minimal risk taking actually because moving and handling people even for care is hard work. Um, we might have the hoist that would lift them and transfer them from A to B. So that's not hard work anymore. We're not physically lifting them. But actually, if you have if you are rolling somebody for personal care, you're rolling somebody to dress and undress them, you're rolling them to change their beds, is that actually sometimes that is physically shattering and it takes a massive toll on people's upper 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 limbs um, so actually although that is in the table as minimal risk taking I actually think it's quite there's a lot of risk for carers um, and you know it's constant that's the difference they're they're going from one one patient to the next one service user to the next or one child to the next whereas a therapist you might see three or four people in a day you might see less than that you might see a few more but actually you'll have variety in what you do as well so your body gets a little bit of a rest so again from a therapy point of view it involves participation from the uh, service user and actually from a care point of view you don't necessarily uh, they don't necessarily need to be uh, take part in it although I must admit I always try to encourage as much as possible for them to be part of the process so it's not just something that's being done to them so therapy wise we're aiming to improve and maintain care wise we're meeting the basic needs to get, give them their activities of daily living there's always a level of professional knowledge as a therapist and actually care handlers just need to be aware of the basic principles of safe handling and using the hoisting equipment safely. Um, therapy, again, I, I know you can read this slide, but it's an individual and goal orientated structured approach, whereas actually care handling is just around the task they're doing at that time. We document our changes, we do that formal assessment and we keep, that's why we keep the notes that we keep. And then from a care point of view, obviously there aren't always those changes. So actually care plans are just updated when the changes happen. Okay, Steve, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is one thing um, that I, I'm sure that we're all aware of our roles and responsibilities, but I think it's always a good thing to um, remind ourselves of our responsibilities as a professional when we're delegating a moving and handling task or a therapy task to somebody else. So we are when we delegate an activity to a carer, whether it be a rehab element or just a care element, we're interest, interested in them to do that task. And they've got a responsibility to agree to undertake that task for us. Um, and we have to make sure as well that they are competent to do that task and, and document that they're competent to do that task. The delegate has to co must communicate changes which affect their ability to perform the task. So sometimes I have with my staff in the schools where I train them is that they won't tell you when there's something wrong with them because they just want to get on with it and help people. Um, whereas I want them to tell me so that we can change the activity so that we can make it easier and we can look at a different way of doing things or actually say, actually, at this point in time, you, you're not able to do that activity and, and I wouldn't want you to do it. And I think what we must remember um, is that the delegate has a right to refuse that task to do that task at any time so we can't make them do it and I think as therapists we are um, certainly in my world in paediatrics we are because of staffing levels um, and things like Covid and how they're impacting on staffing levels um, we are pushing more and more onto carers to do some of that 
therapeutic handling. Um, and we have to be mindful that they can say no. Um, so we need to get them on side with easy activities to do. So actually they continue to, the, the service user continues to have the best of best outcomes that they can. Okay, Steve, go on to the next slide, please. Obviously we are accountable. Um, one of the things that I um, came across when I did a training session for a group of um, NHS therapists a couple of years ago, the therapist was, um, she found it difficult to understand the concept that when she passed on the activity that she wanted the school carer to do, is that she then, because of her caseload, she couldn't go back in to see them on a regular basis to make sure that they were competent. So she felt that she delegated the task and then that was fine. And actually what I said to her is you have to make sure that the appropriate levels of supervision are in place. Because actually what I find in my area in paediatrics is that actually, if you're not supporting those delegates to do those activities, because they're unsure, they won't do them. So actually we need to still be going in and supervising until they're up and running and making sure that they are comfortable with it. And once they're comfortable and comfortable with that activity, then you can step back and put them on a bit more of a review. But actually we are responsible for making sure that that person is competent to do the job that we've given them to do. I hope this is all making perfect sense to you uh, and that I'm not going too quickly for you. Um, OK, so if we go on to the next slide, that would be great. OK, uh, keeping records again, it doesn't matter where you do it, but we should show that we've given um, clear lines of delegation uh, to people. So actually, when we've delegated a task, whether it be um, just a moving and handling care handling activity or whether there's a therapeutic aim to it, is that we we need to document that we have who we have delegated that activity to. Um, so we should keep a record of that person. For me, it's generally quite easy as a therapist because it's usually just the parents I'm dealing with rather than maybe school staff. But you should keep that those notes in your in your records. Um, Again, I've said it before, but good practice dictates that actually our therapeutic interventions are negotiated and agreed with the service user so that we're working to the same goal. Um, and, and sometimes that's a really that's a really emotional discussion to have with people um, because obviously they might think that they are going to get up and walk. I know certainly I can use a, an example from one of my youngsters at the minute. The family are very convinced that this young lady is going to walk she has got all the motor patterns there to potentially do it, but her learning, her cognition is maybe not there to give her the drive to be up on her feet. And it's very difficult to have that conversation with the parent when they're, they're actually determined that their child is going to walk. And I'm not convinced that they are um, because of the learning aspect, even though they've got all the physical building blocks there to do it. And our records must reflect um, and be completed in accordance with our professional bodies guidelines. So that's the College of Occupational Therapy, uh, the CSP and the HCPC. So looking at all of those as well and keeping that at the back of the mind, our mind when we're delegating activities. Okay, Steve, next slide. Right, so this is one of my areas that I'm really passionate about is the safety first. So when we're considering moving and handling, whether that be for care or for a therapy, activity is we need to be considering the safety of the client so again a good assessment will consider their their baseline abilities and again it's about gathering as much medical information as possible because sometimes I go into situations and I know very little and um that's that's always quite a scary situation um when I'm going doing moving and handling assessment so I want as much medical information as possible and speaking to the client, the family and carers and other clinicians as well is a good starting point. And again, just a, a little sort of kind of case study that's going on at the moment is um, I've got a client where there's some disagreement about the package of care. I can't go into too many details, but this young man is very complex, has a very complex medical problem. Uh, from a moving and handling point of view, if he's well, the hoisting isn't a problem, um, but actually caring for him with his medical condition is really, really hard work. And um, the local authority at the minute want him to have a single-handed care package. 
And I don't think this is safe for him or for his for the carers that are working with him in a single handed care manner. Um, and again, the the people that are making the judgments haven't actually spoken to the carers. So actually, when this young man is having a, an episode, he becomes very unsafe and it becomes very unsafe for him and very unsafe for the carers that are looking after him. But nobody has actually taken uh, the information from them to actually find out what it's like to work with him. And I think, you know, the this information that we can gather as professionals about actually what what does that person's day look like, you know, so that we can make a really good judgment about our interventions. Um, bone density status, so low bone mineral density problems are massive in people with complex medical needs. Um, so all my client group that I work with, so children and young adults with um, PMLD, cerebral palsy, they all will have problems with their bone density. And there's a lady called Angela Wing, who is a physiotherapist based in North Wales, and she is the paediatric and learning, adult learning disability lead over in North Wales. And she's just done a study on um, bone density and uh, our management programs within the NHS of uh, protocols for people who might have low bone mineral density. So basically, if you don't weight bear, uh, if you are on anti-epilepsy medication, if you are low weight, if you are tube fed, um, if you don't have access to sunlight, and if you think about a lot of people with complex needs, they're wheelchair users who are, tend to be wrapped up when they go outside, so they don't get a lot of sunlight on their face, which makes vitamin D, which all helps with the bone density status. It's becoming more and more common that um, young people and young adults are sustaining fractures as a result of minimal handling as a result of difficulties with their bone density status. So her research was looking at the number of fractures that have occurred and how they've occurred. And some of them were um, things like uh, physio programs, stretching. Uh, so there was one, one episode where I think it was a humoral, humorous fact, a humoral fracture, and it was just with a stretching program uh, that this person had fractured. Um, even people, even children and young people who have hemiplegia who are generally people with cerebral palsy, hemiplegia, tend to walk, tend to be mobile, but their hemicide often shows osteo, early osteoporotic changes. So when we're doing moving and handling, whether it be care handling or therapeutic handling, and you've got somebody with very, very complex needs, like the client group I work with, we should always be considering their bone density. So one of the things I um, used to get my staff in schools where we may be working with little children who they would choose to manually lift because it's quicker they don't want to wait for the hoist because there might be 10 children in the classroom that need hoisting so they might do a one-man lift they might do a two-man lift now we, we know from a, a legal standpoint and in the uh, manual handling operations regs that it doesn't say that we can't lift it says avoid where you can and assess it so they're doing manual lifting because they're little um, but my argument back to them is always let's look at the safest way of lifting them and that's using the hoist because it's always consistent whereas somebody's hands on somebody they they lift they put different pressure through so we don't know what damage we could be doing to that person so we've got then stability of joints and postural tone they all impact on the moving and handling as well so we should be thinking about those safety considerations and actually that's coming back then to the therapeutic bit thinking about using our equipment some of our moving and handling equipment so that we're perhaps not putting the children at risk although the the adults at risk from poor handling because of the result of those things so next screen please so i just put some hoist images in um just to give you an idea of some of the things that i use in practice um the robin invercare hoist there is brilliant from a point of view there's no spreader bar so if you've got somebody who's got lots of involuntary movements that's fantastic um obviously gantry systems can be used where maybe you haven't can't put it ceiling track hoisting in but you've got room and again they're sometimes good from a therapeutic point of view to have a so have a room set up for a therapy room okay next slide steve um 
active hoist, so the st a standing hoist is really good therapeutically. I've done quite a bit with some of our child my children on my caseload where they might have had some uh, lower limb surgery and we use the active hoist, the standing hoist to get that activity and some early mobilization and activity in their muscles. And then you've got your standard passive hoist there. And again, I have used that with a young man um, in his family home before he had ad adaptations and I used that with a sitting sling so that actually he was in a sitting well he was in a standing sling but we were doing sitting with it he was sitting on the floor the hoist was supporting him which meant that I didn't have to have my hands all, all over him sitting him up which was getting more difficult to do as he got bigger so it meant I could still do some really targeted dynamic hamstring stretches he could do some sitting balance activities but without me holding on to him so the hoisting we can use the range of hoists to actually achieve some therapeutic things um Okay, so next slide. I'm not don't know what's coming next. That's exciting. Right, case studies, how to do it differently. So this is one of my things as a as a physio. So I'm talking now as a physio more than a moving and handling advisor. I've got a, a young adult on my caseload who has got very complex needs. When I started doing his physio, he lives in supported living and um, he would be on the floor. The staff would get him out on the floor on the mats for me and I could stretch him and pull him around and help with his posture and get him more symmetrical. Obviously, we went into COVID, so I stopped going because they shut the home to me. When then things started opening back up, they didn't want me to be in the shared area again because obviously the risk of COVID so I had to treat Jack in his bed which was great from the point of view that I wasn't on the floor anymore and crawling around on my knees but actually I couldn't get to his body in the same way I couldn't climb onto the bed with him because that wouldn't have been appropriate so actually he had some slide sheets which were there for the staff to help him move up and down the bed and reposition him overnight but actually what I discovered is that if I put the slide sheet underneath him and used the two um, supports from his sleep system at his pelvis. So I had the tubular slide sheet under his top half. It meant that I could push on the slide sheet to give him a really good elongated stretch from side to side. So actually I was basically, if you've ever done hydrotherapy and you swish people in the water to get that lovely trunk elongation, I was mimicking that with a slide sheet. So the, the, a tubular slide sheet has become my new best friend and I use it with so many of the children now, A, because it's a bit of fun as well, and you can do so many different things with slide sheets. And in fact, I did a presentation a couple of days training down to the uh, NHS paediatric team in Nottinghamshire. And um, I gave them all a slide sheet, but put them in groups and said, think of ideas of what you can do, how you could use this as, as, a, as a physio tool. And they came up with some fantastic things to engage in sort of kind of reciprocal hand movements, uh, grabbing the sheet. So they were looking at the fine motor stuff. So the OTs were looking at the fine motor stuff and because it's got that sort of kind of sensory aspect as well. So a slide sheet is a really good way of using a piece of moving and handling equipment but to help us with therapeutically as well. And it's same with in-bed management systems. So things like the Wendy Let, uh, the ETAC satin sheet system, they're all really good as well. Um, again, from a case study point of view, um, I had a young lady who had some spinal surgery and we used the cricket transfer aid from Helping Hand. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it, but it's a sit to stand device where you have to be active with it. It's got a little seat that you can sit back down and some little paddles to give you support. Um, and actually Shannon has ended up in the hop seven is due to be coming out in some time this year. And she's there as a, a case study. Um, because actually one of the things it was taking two members of staff to kind of help us sit to stand for toileting we put the cricket in place to make it easier for everybody uh, but actually then the physios used it as a therapeutic tool as well to help her pull herself to stand so help to strengthen and it, she got back to where she could then um, stand transfer on her own so it helped with her strengthening program after her surgery I use active vests an awful lot. In fact, I will just show you one now. You can see the picture of the little girl on the ball. Um, they don't do these particular model in adult sizes, but these are fantastic for doing a range of sitting activities, standing activities, because again, it allows you as a therapist to have the person supported 
and them to be able to be active and you're not holding on to them. Um, for adults, again, in, in early rehab ICU type settings, if you've got hoisting available, you can use a range of slings to get people sat on the side of the bed, you know, and thinking about the number of people it might take to do that when somebody's been in intensive care is using the hoisting equipment to sit somebody and balance them in a sling starts to get them that feeling of being upright. I do know as well that um, Arjo have just recently started of, of, uh, of doing a, a product called the Coma home mobilizer i think it is which again is looking at that early rehab so it can sit people up it can stand them so actually companies are getting more aware of this need for this early rehab and actually hopefully that cuts down as well on maybe the numbers of staff that would be needed to do it so again it frees up more time so it gives you more time to care and look after people okay steve next slide okay so um this is a client of mine who is a young adult with um, athetoid CP. She loves being a model and we use the lockable trainer module uh, that Goldman do that offsets the weight. Now, if I tell you Bex is 27 and her life generally is in her uh, a powered chair that she can't operate, her carers operate for her. Her physio programs have always been around stretching and maintaining her posture. She's a bit of a daredevil and she actually wants to do some activity. She wants to sort of feel like you and I do if we do some exercise. She wants to get a bit out of breath. So we went and had a, a mess around with the lockable trainer module and actually we got her sat out on a ball. And yes, there's two of us supporting her, but she had such good fun. So I think that's the thing for me as well is using our equipment to allow people to have a bit of fun and experience movement that perhaps they wouldn't normally experience. So there she sat on the therapy ball and actually uh, the one with the sling behind her shoulders, she was actually, we were using the bed and the hoist together and we were getting her to do some sit-ups and she was getting, you could see that she was getting some real activity. The upshot of this is clinically, what's it done for her? It's improved her posture in her wheelchair. So her right leg would always uh, spring out of the foot plate, whereas she's now able to keep her right leg in her, in her foot plate with her, her pommel between her legs. So actually her sitting posture has got much better. The staff aren't clattering her leg against the door every time they go through a door with her. Okay, Steve, on to the next slide, please. Okay, and there's another picture of her and I can show you the piece of equipment. So we were using the, um, the offset weight bit there and she was doing some bridging so she was activating her glute muscles and um, we now mimic this at home we haven't got the fantastic uh, lockable trainer module at a house but what i have got is the multi-support sling which we put under a bottom and then we use a contraption to attach to a hoist and it's a Basically, it's a bit like old fashioned sling suspension therapy, but we attach that to the hoist and it gives us that bit of bounce so she can activate again, activate a core. And it, it's given it's given me a different thing to do to it. It's less intensive for me. If I was trying to get her to bridge manually, I wouldn't be able to do it because physically she's too heavy for me to do that. But actually with that piece of equipment, all she needs is a tiny little prompt. OK, next slide. OK, so they're my useful tools. So I haven't talked about the B assist yet. So it's more tubular slide sheet because that's great for doing trunk movements. Positioning wedges are great for putting people into positions and keeping there. The active vest I've talked about. Now the B assist, again, there's a case study on this. I am conscious that it's quarter to three and there's going to be questions and answers, but this is probably my last one. So the B assist is a piece of equipment that's made by GP UK. It's really, really simple. It's a sheet with handles on it. Now I've used this to get uh, my young adults who like to go prone on wedges. It's a way of um, turning people onto their tummy. Um, we've got one young man in school who's 16, loves going on his tummy to access the curriculum. He can't do it anywhere else because he's a little bit like an ironing board. Um, but if we put him on a wedge, he can access activities that they do in class with him. And it was taking four people to do it. We've got one of those for him and it now takes two people. So it's actually cut down the moving and handling that the staff were having to do. And it's much more, um, it's it's just much more efficient for, for him as well and less people pulling on him. And again, um, 
it's more of a so that's sort of a therapeutic thing him going on his tummy but I have got a young adult uh, with CP who um, is hoisted for her transfers and the she'd had a four-way glide put in place to help her, her carers roll her um, to put a sling on to hoist her out into a wheelchair now, she was finding the four way glide made her feel a little bit sick. She was losing her position in bed overnight and she hadn't wasn't having good night's sleep on it. And she she could communicate all of this to me. Um, she has pain when she moves and she describes her pain as a nine out of ten when she's using the four way glide with with her members of staff. Uh, we tried the B assist. We just did it as a little bit of an experiment. And actually, I so it was taking two people even with the four way glide. And so I managed to roll her onto a side uh, really quickly. Uh, in fact, she said, I thought you were going to throw me out of bed. And it worked really, really well on the assessment. And she said her pain was a four out of 10 and it didn't make her feel sick. So the B assist is a really, really good piece of a kit, kit for getting people into side lying, for fitting slings, uh, for doing rolling activities or for getting into prone. Um, so that's that's a fantastic bit of kit as well. So if you could go on to the next slide, which might be the any burning question. So we'll ignore that one. Thank you very much, Penny. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, a QA, and a um, if any of you uh, tuned in and we've still got a couple of hundred people in the room right now i've got any burning questions as the title suggests um please feel free to pop them into the chat and i will read them out to penny um unless they are questions uh specifically for us on our products and of course we can uh, we can address those in the chat um so let me just open up the chat box and see what we have make them easy questions <laughs> I can't promise that they're going to go easy on you, Penny. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's one from um, from Jody McCarthy here. Any recommendations for online training regarding manual handling, and if any, provide risk assessment templates, etc. Can you assist with that, Penny? Oh, online training. No, I can't assist with the online training. So that's a real cop out, isn't it? Um... <sighs> It depends what you're looking for in online training. Are you looking for the legal aspect? Because uh, there's probably lots of places out there that will do that. Or are you looking for something more specific? And it's, it's looking at uh, probably independent moving and handling providers. Um, what was the other part to it? The risk assessment templates. Yes. Um, risk assessment templates. Obviously, um, National Back Exchange, there is one in... Uh, the manual handling children book which you might not want to buy but that's one that they've said that you can share and use uh, i'll just see if i can flick through to it so national back exchange may have some risk assessment templates in their documentation they certainly have got leaflets around hoist and sling selection uh, so um that's something uh, your governing body so the apcp for me the association of pediatric physios have got an assessment template in their documentation and the CSP certainly have got a moving and handling um, publication and that's got a risk assessment template in it. And I think the Royal College of OT will have a risk assessment template. Um, again, sometimes it's taking the templates and um, making them bespoke to you. You don't have to have everything in that a full template might have. You make it tailor it to your needs. So I hope that's answered your question. But there's there's lots of stuff out there in terms of risk assessment templates. HSC is another another place as a, another starting point. I'm just trying to find the one in here so I could just show you what one, a really simple one looks like. There it is. There it is. So there's a real simple sort of pictorial assessment one there, which is really really useful for a quick snapshot assessment. But there's lots out there. It's just look look to your governing bodies. Thank you, Penny. We've got um, we've got lots of interaction on the chat now, which is good. Um, we've got some suggestions coming out. Things like the Rift and Tram is a great walking hoist. Thank you, yeah. Tanya. Um, we've got some other opinions here. There's lots of uh, lots of people wanting more details and better information on the B assist in okay. terms of who makes it, where can they get it, we really okay. like it, etc. Yeah, it is. It is. It's one of those. You know, when you 
I've been around for a long time now and and this is when people say to me about training you know how often should you do training it's like well actually maybe the training doesn't change but actually the equipment does and we're getting more and more innovation in the moving and handling world so to the answer the question the be assist is the one thing that's made me very very excited uh, just recently it came out in September so it's GB UK are the company that do it um so if you contact them, Jacqueline Murphy, I can't, I haven't got her email address off the top of my head, but Jacqueline Murphy would be the person to speak to at GB UK. So Jacqueline Murphy at GB UK. Thank you, Penny. That's, that's literally answered about half a dozen people <laughs> in a row have all put the same thing. So that's going down pretty well. Fabulous interaction, guys. Thank you very much. Keep your questions coming if there's some more. Um, I'm just going to skim through some. Um, the Manual Handling Children's Book. Who's the author, please, says Emma Donaldson. So the author, the authors, actually, it's authors. So Pat Alexander, Carol Johnson and myself. So there were the three of us. Um, it's this time because this is the second edition. The first edition is still relevant, but it's not at, in print now. Um, the second edition has got some some of the stuff that the first edition had in it but we have done more sort of case study based stuff there's um some uh, stuff around the acute sector um there's some in there about rehab handling there's a lot about uh, postural support equipment and the importance of postural support for people with complex needs so it's a very different book to the first one but it's still got some of the the standard stuff in that the first book had and you can get it from national back exchange so if you go to nationalbackexchange.org um and you'll click there's a link there for publications and i think for off the top of my head for NBE members, it's thirty pounds for non-NBE members, it's thirty-five. But don't don't quote me on that bit. Fabulous, thank you. Um, there are a few people uh, that happen to join the webinar, kind of halfway through, or maybe even later than that. Um, for those asking, uh, absolutely, we we always record the monthly webinars. Uh, we recognise that your schedules can change at a moment's notice, and as a result, um, we always record them and then send out those uh, downloadable links to you uh, in the uh, in the next day or so, um, so you can use it as a tool and a reference guide at any time you wish. Um, a couple. Sorry, Steve, I've just noticed in the chat box as well, because I can see them. Yeah. Uh, please just ask for that for me to repeat the names of the authors again. So Carol Johnson. Pat Alexander, Penny Townsend, which happens to be me. <laughs> the giveaway. <laughs> uh, we have one more question as well. Uh, let's just have a quick look. Um, Penny, in fact, if you can see the chat box, do you want to, to, to read that one second from bottom there? Is that the one that says, I have another question? Sorry if you've already covered it. I have a major issue at work. Is that the one? That's the bunny, yeah. I have a major issue on the sites. So I'll read the question. Sorry if you've already covered it. I have a major issue at one of the sites that I work between therapy staff and manual handling trainer who is not a therapist. The manual handling trainer thinks that they can change any risk assessment done by the therapist. What is your opinion on that? Uh, I don't think they can change that risk assessment because it's your risk assessment that you've done as a professional. What I would say, I don't like conflict. I've never liked conflict. So I would always come back to them and ask them what it is that they're struggling with around your risk assessment. And actually it comes back to, can you look for alternatives as a therapist that might make the moving and handling trainer happier? So I don't know whether that's answered your question, but I would always have a discussion, but they shouldn't change your risk assessment because it's your risk assessment. Good stuff. Thank you, Penny. Thank you very much. Um, guys, um, if you have any questions uh, that you think of after the event, please feel free to email them through to info at yorkshirecareequipment.com. Um, Penny, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. Absolute pleasure to have you. And thank you so much. I, I'm sure that the people have, uh, have enjoyed it, got a lot out of it. We had a couple of te technical hiccups, but we got there in the yes, end. Yes, so sorry about that. It worked. It was you, Steve. You you put the kibosh on it. That's what it was. It was you doing your screen, I'm sure. Um, yeah, and thanks everybody for for listening. Obviously, it's a snap. It's a snapshot. I would have loved to have been in front of you because I'm not naturally somebody who likes sitting down on my bottom. I like to jump around, and I'd have got you doing things as well. So, uh, but I just hope it's given you a little bit of food for thought.
Fabulous. Thank you very much, guys. And again, we'll send out the links for the full recorded webinar in the next couple of days. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Thank you.